Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. Uh, we, you know, a, a lot is kind of, I'm not sure preordained, but it's not like, you know, sort of, we, we saw it uh, coming a bit in the distance, but a lot has happened over the last, uh, I don't know, 72 hours or something like that. In pretty rapid succession, the bipartisan mini bill passed, um, passed the Senate, uh, obviously, it still has to pass the House. Uh, it's still, you know, a signature by the president would be a foregone conclusion as long as it has a reconciliation bill. Um, but what is key is that the one, the one part of this kind of global, you know, deal process that the Democrats don't control, that isn't, you know, entirely within uh, the Democratic uh, Party's control, or at least, you know, members of the Democratic Party, is needing those Republican senators to, you know, to vote the 10 votes for the Democrats who feel they need a bipartisan deal. So that's done. That's done. And it can't be undone. They can't come back and say, oh, wait, wait, wait. the reconciliation bill is too big. We, we're, we're unvoting for the mini bill. And, and that's what is, that's what's really pretty key here. And, and in a lot of ways, shows you how this is a this is a pretty big accomplishment for Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer because if you remember I don't even know how long ago it was now was I mean I lose track of time was it 2 months ago was it a month ago when uh the president had that you know kind of press availability where he sort of you know kind of riffed and said uh oh, comes to my desk without the reconciliation bill I'm not signing it and there was this you know huge Republican freak out. Oh, you never said it was blah, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, Cause they didn't, I think they've, you know, they have been, they've been equivocal. I don't think they've known quite where they want to be there for a while, but basically he got them, a lot of them, I think 18 of them to vote for it, even though they know the other bill is coming. Now, that that doesn't mean it's going to be totally smooth sailing as Democrats kind of haggle over, you know, the exact amount of the reconciliation bill. Is it going to be 3.5 trillion? Is it going to be, you know, 3.45 trillion because Kirsten Cinema decides she wants to, you know, w- wants to uh, uh, put up a stink or something. And even beyond the the top line number, there's going to be a lot of drama and negotiating and pushing and pulling to figure out exactly how that 3.5 trillion gets divided up and obviously it is not in it is not entirely uh about dollars there's you know particularly on things well really across the board but i think what has a lot of has the most focus for a lot of us is in the climate stuff, you know, fine, you're spending this much on climate, but exactly what are you doing on climate? So there's a lot of stuff there. And yet, Schumer and Biden got those votes, and now it is out of Republican hands. And it's kind of a funny thing, because I remember, um, you know, back when this kind of, uh, you know, concept deal was still being hashed out. Remember, there was like the gang of, there was the five and the gang of 10 and the gang of 20 and all these different gangs and everything. But there was a point where the, you know, five Republicans, five Democrats came up with the outline of the deal. And that's around the time there was the freak out and and all that kind of stuff. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was a very senior uh, staffer in on the Senate side on, up on Capitol Hill for like, you know, decades. And this person said, and kind of shared my thoughts. I mean, generally speaking, when you when you make a compromise with the party in in power, you know, you're the minority power. You're the minority power eh, party. You cut a deal. Usually, it's like, okay, we're going to come to you on this, but you got to agree not to do other stuff, right? What are they like? What are they getting here? And I think many of us thought, and I think a lot of the Republicans thought that, well, what we're going to be getting here is we're going to undermine the Democrats' ability to do their big reconciliation bill. We'll go a little further than we might want on this um, 
on this mini bill. But what that will do is it will make it, it it'll make it impossible to do the reconciliation bill, and that will not only um, you know uh, sort of tie the hands of the Democrats, it'll set off like a, a kind of a mini civil war within the Democratic Party, which it would have. But that didn't happen. So there are a lot of us, I would include myself, that um, you don't need to do a, a bipartisan mini bill. Frankly, you don't even need to do rec- reconciliation. You should just get rid of the filibuster and just pass what you want to pass. But there are there are at least two, I mean, we know the two, the two senators who it was really important to get a bipartisan deal. Now, why it was important to them, we can discuss that forever, but it was important to them. And there were other people who it was maybe not a condition of moving forward, but they did want it. And Joe Biden wanted it. Now, some of that, I think, is kind of characterological, his history in the Senate, wanting to prove he could do it. Um, and I don't think it was a condition. I don't think it was like he wasn't going to – I think if this had, if that had fallen apart, he would have gone to the Democratic caucus and say, look, we tried. We tried really hard. We did our best. It didn't work. Now we're going to do it all through the reconciliation bill. And I think that would have happened. But all things being equal, he did want it. And those are some of the reasons. But one of the other reasons is that I think he believes, and I know some of his key advisors believe, that it'll help him politically in 2022 and 2024. And all things being equal, I think he's probably right. Now, there's a big, there's a a kind of a, I wouldn't even say it's a debate within the Democratic Party. It's more of a consensus of saying, look, the public cares what you do. They probably didn't even know how it was how it was passed, and they really don't care. It, it it matters what you do. So, doing something that sucks or is incomplete on a bipartisan basis that accomplishes nothing. I hundred percent believe that. But what Joe Biden and 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 Chuck Schumer have done here is to kind of have their cake and eat it too, because it does look like they are going to end up getting something pretty close to their entire agenda through the Senate. And then, you know, I think it'll be easier in the House, although nothing's too easy in the House since the margin is so close now. Um, so, you know, uh, a, a lot of us kind of didn't care about the bipartisan stuff, but if you can, if you can toss that on too, kind of at the, at, and, and not give, kind of give anything up substantively, fine, go for it. And I do think that that um, Democrats underestimate the extent to which it does matter to some voters. 100% it does not matter anywhere near as much as the substantive thing you do. But there is a non-trivial part of the electorate that just kind of likes the idea of like, oh, president got everybody kind of on board, you know. Brought us together, all that kind of stuff. Doesn't mean anything to me. It does matter to some people. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, with my co-host, Kate. Uh, but before we do that, let us let me remind you, uh, as we get to the end of the summer, that Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee is here to help you cut through the heat this summer. You know, it's funny. Where I uh, live, it's actually been pretty mild recently, but today it's like up at the 90 again. So this is, you know, very, uh, very time appropriate. Their famous New Orleans-style coffee stays fresh in your fridge, so you never have to wait in line, pay coffee shop prices, or leave your air conditioning. Concentrated and strong, Grady's tastes great however you take it. Black and bold, light and sweet, or even spiked. Grady's is the best cold brew value around. Order a six-pack of bean bags, and you can get 72 servings of cold brew shipped directly to your door for only 45 bucks, And shipping's free. If you're ready to give it a try, get 25% off your first order at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. That's Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. All right, co-host Kate, what is up? Yeah, well, for a chamber that, you know, often plods along as slowly as some of its most senior members, we had quite a flurry of activity the past, you know, especially the past 24 hours where, like you say, we have the bipartisan bill passed. 
and then Cuomo steps on all over that with his resignation. But then minutes later, they move into the Voterama on the budget resolution, which is the, you know, the top line numbers for the reconciliation package. And they do that all night. And then it ends with a little kind of uh, Schumer setting up a showdown on voting rights when they get back from recess. And then boom, at like four or five this morning, all the senators kind of wearily straggled from the chamber, got into their cars and they're gone for the next month. So So the 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 vote on the reconciliation bill, or this is actually, I forget what it's, it's basically an organizing rev, res, resolution, kind of like the here's our game. Resolution. Yeah, budget right. resolution. Mm-hmm. Um, that was actually voted like three or four o'clock in the morning. Yep. Like the actual vote. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, what I, I um, and, and I don't know if you were up for this stuff. I think you were on the Hill basically the entire day covering mm-hmm. this and, 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 uh, but, but apparently there was something like in the middle of the night with Chuck Schumer and Ted Cruz, yeah. like he's like doing uh, Ted holding up some ambassadors. And then I, I guess he wouldn't be in a position to not allow the vote on the voting rights stuff since that's after what happened. What right. we're always so, looking for a good story about Ted being. <laughs> yeah. So in these kind of waning hours after we've had all of these amendment votes, which it's good to note, the budget resolution is non-binding. So all these amendment votes are also non-binding. Um, so basically, it's just hours to let Republicans get in messaging amendments by and large, you know, kind of, we we won't let any immigrants across the border who have COVID, you know, stuff like that. It's not really has anything to do with the package. It's just they've got the power to stretch it out, make it painful, so they're going to do it. And then towards the end, um, Ted Cruz, I think he was mad about the Nord Stream. Yeah, the, this this uh, pipe, Russian pipeline, right. uh, oil and gas into. I don't know the details, but it's a it it is a pretty. There's a lot of debate about it because it arguably kind of, um, you know, ties uh, Russian oil and gas into into Europe and stuff. Biden. Uh, gave it a go ahead. And I think that people like Ted Cruz suddenly after, you know, kind of four years of loving Trump have decided that Putin is not a great guy and (laughs) and he's all upset. So yeah, so he's upset about that. So there was a little kerfuffle over that. And then you had Schumer basically set up what's next on the Senate's legislative calendar, which is going to be another voting rights push. You know, things have been pretty stagnant on that front since the Republicans filibustered the For the People Act back in June. So Schumer filed cloture on a, a vehicle, basically, that will be filled in with the pared down For the People Act that a group of senators is working on kind of behind the scenes right now, incorporating uh, Manchin's, you know, kind of notes or alterations from the original bill taking out some stuff that might be objectionable, kind of leaving just core tenants in place. Um, so now, when, when you say a group of senators there, yep. I assume you mean a group of Democratic senators. Right, right, right. Right. Democrats, okay. So no, yep. this isn't one of the bipartisan groups no. or anything like that. Nope, just Got Democrats, it. spearheaded by Klobuchar and Warnock right now. Um, so he basically just put that vehicle into place and then made some remarks on the floor how you know, first things when they get back in September, going to be a renewed voting rights push. And as we all know, that effort seems just as doomed as the June effort because the filibuster persists thanks to Manchin and Cinema. But, you know, Schumer is basically just doing a war of attrition right now, hoping that if they keep taking these votes and keep showing that Republicans are going to obstruct every single part of uh, any voting rights protections, you know, kind of poke a hole in Manchin's ridiculously optimistic balloon that there will be 10 Republican votes to protect uh, voting rights. So he basically sets up this vehicle, which is going to be, you know, the locus of the legislative action when they get back. And then he called three bills to the floor in succession and asked for unanimous consent on them. This is by this point, it's like 4 a.m. The chamber is basically empty. Everybody's left. But Ted Cruz is still there to do the objecting work. So, you know, he first, Schumer calls the For the People Act. And to be fair to him, Mm -hmm. 
so this isn't him just deciding he wants to be there to be a dick. I mean, Republicans needed to leave someone right. behind to kind of speak for them. And he exactly. got, he, they left him. Got it. Okay. Right. So Schumer brings up the For the People Act again, and then a redistricting bill, and then the Disclose Act, which is about uh, dark money donations. You know, and Cruz objects to them all. They have some kind of like back and forth. And then, uh, yeah, and then that's a wrap <laughs> around 5 a.m. <laughs> that's, that's, that's when it all ended. Now, do we know? Um, I, I have heard. I've heard different theories of what Democrats are thinking w- with the For the People Act. I mean, one is, I guess, one approach or one uh, idea of how this would go is: look, we're just going to keep bringing it up, and we're going to sort of make a stink each time and say we're trying to protect your right to vote. Republicans keep refusing to protect your right to vote. And it's sort of a mess, you know, in, in a way, it's basically a messaging strategy. Um, I have heard other, and another um, another version of that is that you are really, you're not even playing to the public so much as you're playing to Joe Manchin, basically, right. to kind of, to, 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 you know, rub in his face, as it were, the futility of what he claims is is what can work, his strategy, et cetera. I have also heard, and this is and and when I say heard in this context, I don't mean heard by insiders or people who are running the show. I mean just observers on the outside speculating that um, if the reconciliation process and that bill is going well, and kind of Joe Biden gets everything he wants, that he'll have you know, kind of be empowered and he'll come off that and kind of say to the Democratic caucus, look, you know, we're here to do stuff and and somehow persuade these two to do something to, you know, kind of loosen things up. Um, I think I think many other people are worried and I don't I don't I don't think this is exactly right, but there's definitely a legitimate worry that that people will look at what happened and say, hey, you know, look, bipartisanship worked. You know, kind of, you kind of worked with them, got everything done. You're not going to try to, you know, let's stop fighting. Let's all be friends and let's not do things like getting rid of the filibuster. So do you, do you have any sense of kind of what the plan is with the For the People Act or this kind of like slim down version? Well, on your last point, I think the idea that McConnell knew going along with the bipartisan bill might take some wind out of the sails of the anti-filibuster argument is definitely true. Um, and I, I also think he was still hoping that it might make reconciliation harder for Democrats. But I think that was definitely part of the calculus. And I've kind of long thought that the nexus of the filibuster fight was going to happen when Democrats simply couldn't do anything else. And that'll be the reality after reconciliation. You know, we'll just at that point, it's almost, you know, why would Biden or Schumer, whomever, worry about burning bridges when it's like either Manchin and Zinema agree to get rid of the filibuster or legislating is done until right, the midterms right. and if they lose a the chamber for the rest of Biden's term. So, I mean, stakes are high at that point, but it's all it's you got everything you could do from yep. kind of being creative and trying to govern via the budget process. So that's the end of the road. Yeah, and and when I said that I don't think people are right that that um, that this will uh, you know kind of take the wind out of anti filibuster activism, I want to I want to be clear what I meant by that. I only think that that it it's not gonna it's not going to make the filibuster any more powerful. Like I suspect, like if if Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are just like they're never going to do it, they're not more never going to do it exactly because of this. Um, and I also kind of think that if they're maybe open to it, I I I don't think this will make that big of a difference to that. Um, but that's that is the way. I mean, again, I think that is a that is a very reasonable theory of the case and concern um right. it, it's just that again I, I i i don't buy the argument that and i i i discussed this in a post uh sometime earlier this week i, I don't buy the argument that getting 
this fiscal infrastructure climate thing through has you know ruined the chances to get the for the people act that's just not that just doesn't make any sense to me that's it i I think it's unfortunately i think it's unlikely to happen at all but i don't think it's less likely to happen because of this right i'm with you i mean i think if they do point to the bipartisan bill as an argument against the filibuster they were never going to change their tune so it it doesn't really matter all things being equal but i have to say i am probably at my most like depressed place about the future of the filibuster now than I have been all term just because I think it was so inconceivable for a while the idea that Democrats would have toppled Trump would have you know eked out the Senate with with those two unbelievable Georgia Senate races you know won the house and that still a member of the Democratic caucus or two members of the Democratic caucus would, despite all of that, despite the fact that they won those elections and overcame voter suppression and the big lie and January 6th and all the rest, would still let Republicans have a veto over everything that Democrats want to do. It was just so inconceivable to me that I was just like, okay, well, Manchin's saying what he has to say. Cinema is trying to like newly established herself this term or something but you know it's temporary they're going to be they're going to be saying that while they can kind of get cooking on other stuff and then they'll be wooed and you know maybe arizona and west virginia will have some beautiful new structures in place but that's that and we've just kind of gotten past that point where what is inconceivable to me seems to be where they've come down and where they're staying well, let let's but let's see the other part of it. I mean, if this if if the mini bill and reconciliation bill package both pass kind of as a, you know, as a duo, as a as mm-hmm. a combined set with you know, roughly what we think they're talking about, that is that is a massive thing. That is totally. like a a generations worth of um you know, fiscal policy, national investment policy that Democrats have been clamoring for, especially the sort of the more, you know, kind of activist progressive wing of the party have been clamoring for, for, I mean, you know, arguably for 50 years, but in a more kind of immediate sense, you know, for 10 or 20 years and, and, uh, you know, major, major moves on, climate. Now, as I as I alluded to before, we're going to get into like ex, you know exactly what are we talking about on climate. And and I'm I'm sure there will be some things that won't quite be what sort of the most uh you know ambitious climate activists want. I mean, there would that that is that is almost a given, but there's a lot and I noticed, like in our live blog today, I, I you know, it, it, um, you know, even some of the big groups kind of saying, "Yep, you know, we're cautiously optimistic. This looks pretty good." So that is, I don't want to undersell just how massive that will be if it happens. Now, um, that you know, kind of that is climate and fiscal policy. We obviously have. Uh, I mean, the key thing really is the For the People Act. I mean, that is the sort of the fundamental thing. Um, certainly people in the labor movement, and I agree with them, see the PRO Act in, 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 in comparable terms, although that is, I think, less... Uh, every, every Democrat who's involved and interested in follows politics knows about the For the People Act and, and the arguments about what's at stake, at stake there. Uh, much less... Pe- Far fewer people are focused on on the pro act, um, and yes, then there's there's a bunch of other things. It's really, but I feel like this really comes down to democracy f- reform as the right. other thing. And if you can't, I mean, because there's a bunch of other things, and I think they should expand the Supreme Court to thirteen justices and and do a bunch of other stuff. But I feel like that is the that's the big unfinished business if it doesn't happen. Right. I mean, and the two things we're talking about here, just to, you know, make it very stark, are intrinsically linked. Kind of the reason that the reconciliation bill is 
on track to be historic, sweeping, most liberal or most progressive legislation, you know, passed for however many years is because everyone involved is very aware that it's the last guaranteed piece of legislation they're going to be able to pass. Yep. So, you know, it just it raises the stakes so much, which is why, you know, I have been in touch with a lot of the kind of interested groups, particularly on the climate end, and really have just been getting, I mean, and so far we're still, you know, legislative text hasn't been written, specific allotments have not yet been assigned, which is going to be important because, you know, uh, some people I've talked to have said, looks great. We're glad to see all our priorities in there. We'll see if they're funded to the degree they need to be to actually make a dent in these issues. Right. So there are still things to come. But I think kind of the fundamental central piece, and there are a lot of, you know, tangential climate pieces that kind of orbit around this. But the main piece, the the clean electricity standard and the system of tax credits and tax uh, and then and penalties for utility companies that don't kind of keep systematically switching to more, you know, green sources of of energy is kind of the crux of it. And that from from what I've been talking to people about is like that's the revolutionary piece. That's the could make a world of difference kind of piece. Because if we can make our electricity grid less you know, turning out so much less pollution. That just, that's a chain reaction that changes everything. And they've specifically crafted it in this reconciliation friendly way. You know, that's why they're doing kind of tax incentives and penalties kind of thing to keep it very budgetary to make right. sure it kind of flies by the bird rule. So, you know, at that point, then you just have to worry about people like Manchin. Um, oh, is, isn't there what I, and, and uh, I have, focus less on the sort of the moving parts of, of, of this. But my understanding is that that Manchin is on board with that at a general level, but he wants it to be like technology agnostic, which I which I interpret to mean that the the system would say, okay, you have to move towards um, you know, uh, producing electricity that only creates this much carbon. And uh, one way to do that would be to say, and obviously that means stop using coal or stop using natural gas or stop burning oil or what all the all the obvious things. And he wants a plan that allows you to kind of use offsets and stuff or something like that. Is so that is that basically right? Where it is now is. And there are some progressive environmental groups who have an issue with where it, technically they've renamed it the Clean Electricity Payment Plan, but Clean Electricity Standard, kind of same deal, but who have an issue with it because it counts as that kind of clean energy that you're supposed to be moving towards. It counts within that uh, natural gas and coal that has carbon capture technology so right. you know technology that takes the carbon dioxide out of the air and stores it underground basically right. which is right. like the technology is like not really all the way there yet and you know leakages into the ground it's just, it's not it's not great so people say that some progressives groups say well this is a way to just keep fossil fuels baked into the system but a lot of other people say yeah we don't love it but the economic drivers here are just going to push towards, you know, solar and wind anyway, because they're just going to get progressively cheaper than these other ways. Plus, they're trying to do this on a very expedited timeline. So I think the hope is, you know, we don't love it. It's not great, but it's going to kind of help us get to where we're going faster than if you kind of went cold turkey, said you have to only use renewables, that that would take right. people longer to shift on to and you know, everything like that. Plus there is just the, the piece of it that I think it makes it an easier sell to mansion. They're not saying you can't use coal, you know, they're saying, get on board. That's part of it. Blah, blah, blah. We're not going to put people out of business. You know, I, I do think right. it just kind of, they've put all the pieces in specifically to try to, to get around the obstacle. Yep. To yeah. mansionize it and yeah. to birdize yeah. it. <laughs> well, so I guess one part there, I mean, this, this is different. This is not 
I don't think they're talking about offsets in this sense. But, you know, for years we've had this thing of like, oh, I, you know, took my extended family on a tour of the world, but I bought carbon offsets. And usually those are, you know, I, I think it is, it is, uh, um, a lot of those turn out to be bogus. You buy those to make yourself feel better and doing this and, car, you know, carbon offsets and all that kind of stuff. But often they, it, it's not really clear if you are actually offsetting what you're doing. Um, and I guess here, if you're talking about carbon capture, and in theory, I mean, at the end of the day, what we really care about is how much net additional carbon is going into the atmosphere. Um, but you can see, I certainly see the climate hawks take on that kind of like, man, you're just coming up with a way to avoid this and you kind of keep uh, keep coal going. I I do think, though, that if you, even if those capture systems are not perfect, they are going to be so costly that that certainly coal exactly. just becomes non-economic and it yep. kind of, you know, it's not great, but it's, it's going to put those things out of business pretty quickly. And again, I'm sure I'm going to hear from a lot of people saying how it's, it's really doesn't, it's, I agree. It shouldn't be, but I mean, it's a hell, I, I was telling someone, um, and again, there, there's, we're going to have a lot of arguments within the demo, within among democratic legislators over the next two or three months to kind of get this figured out. And there's a lot of important questions. A lot of the technical details are really ones that I'm not familiar enough with to kind of say what's enough and, you know, uh, uh, what's not enough. But I was, I was having a conversation with someone else about this, uh, yesterday and kind of, you know, what's enough. Well, really for the last 20 years, we've been at zero, right. Um, you know, kind of one to 10, we're, we're at zero. Basically, nothing has happened. And now, under Obama, there was you know investments and in subsidies for for uh, renewables. So some, but in terms of like, hey, you have to stop using, you have to stop putting this much carbon in into the environment. It's nothing. I mean, there was a there was a period. Um, uh, I mean, God, back like. 15 years ago where briefly there were there was actually a decent amount of bipartisan support for these you know these kind of offset systems you know the, the I forget I forget the name of name of what this is called but the idea being the government says okay as a as a country we can produce this much you know carbon into the environment and you kind of create a market and you buy and sell it and stuff like that. But then that never happened. And then suddenly it became an anathema for Republicans. So basically for the last 20 years, when we've known about climate change for longer than 20 years, but 20 years that it's been clearly at crisis levels at, in the, you know, in, in, in this way, we've been at zero and like, are we going to get to 10? I, I doubt it. Um, but we could get to eight and that's, that's a, big difference you know um so you know we'll see i mean it's even um i think like many people and this is not even just kind of people on the outside it what what is what is most frightening is that you have even a lot of climate scientists saying in the last year like wow this is quicker than we thought yep you know and that's pretty fucking scary um but that's where we are so uh yeah. Right. And we just had that um that climate, climate report. report, yep, from the UN group this week that was just so I don't know, just broke down in kind of such stark terms that every degree we like heat the planet, it just it kind of unlocks a whole new level of catastrophes. So I do think from my from my uh talking with these various climate groups, like to, in some degree they feel that not only is this their legislative moment because it's the only opening they've really had but there's also kind of a sense of people are paying attention in a more urgent way than they have been before and you know some of them do kind of attribute that in large part to the Biden administration really being the first he's the first president we've had who has centered climate from the beginning you know it hasn't it hasn't been so much 
like for Obama, they chose healthcare, right? That was going to be their big thing. And obviously they thought that they would be able to dispense with it more quickly and move on to other things. But that was kind of his marquee item. But for Biden, climate was pretty central during the campaign. It was central when he took office. You know, it's a huge part of kind of those plans he laid out from the beginning. So I think they also feel that they have the attention of the administration more than they ever have. So those things are kind of going in lockstep. Right. I mean, and another thing just for people to kind of think about this in a slightly uh, not longer term, but more than, you know, more than six month time horizon. Let's say this this these two bills pass in roughly the outline that we are thinking and roughly the scale that we're thinking. Now, let's say that uh, Democrats have a disappointing midterm election, which is certainly the more likely option and lose one or even both houses of Congress. Okay. Joe Biden's still president. And so that's going to set up a situation where now is, is, uh, is everything that was done lost the climate stuff, the budget stuff, all the kind of stuff. Well, no, because they're not going to be able to override, override any, any vetoes by Joe Biden. They can probably do some stuff at the margin in terms of appropriations, like, oh, you passed this bill, but we're going to try to pull back some, a little, not much. And so if that happens, the reality is it's, I mean, as we saw with Obamacare, it's pretty hard to undo things. It's, it's, it's tough. Um, you're going to have a couple years of kind of letting all that sink in, letting the money start to flow, letting all these things happen. They're not going to, you know, they Democrats could get destroyed in 2022. They still got Joe Biden there, who's still going to be vetoing anything. And it wouldn't surprise me if they come back and say, okay, we're just doing this bill where we overturn everything you did and fine, Joe Biden will veto it. So it's just, it's just you know, there's so much on the line. It's such an opportunity. Yes, the margins are close. Yes, you can have a big uh, midterm, but and this will this is another reason why it will be so important, even if they have a bad midterm. How you get that money flowing, because once the money's flowing, once once your bridges are start you know getting built and and electric power stations and you know people start getting new uh, you know people start going to community colleges without having to, you know, or states or whatever, all these different things, it gets hard to pull it back. Um, So I don't think, I think this, whatever they get done is going to stick because it's hard to unstick. Um, So yeah, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, kind of once a generational opportunity and, and um, with a lot of the stuff, I mean, you know, all the spending stuff is great, but like we could wait a few years for social democracy, right? We can't really wait. Any, we can't. We're kind of here, and you, you know, this, this and this. I do think is is even even from the point, even even from Biden's election. I think this has further shaped the debate because, man, you see, like out in the Pacific Northwest, where where the climate's actually pretty mild, it's like 120 degrees, mm-hmm. and you see these, you know, uh. Many of you have probably seen versions of this, but there have been days here in New York where the air quality is much worse. I, you know, I do woodworking, right? So this is a, a big thing of mine, and so I'm, I'm, I know a lot about filtering the air because uh, sawdust is is bad for you. It's a carcinogen, right? There have been days here in New York where the air quality is much worse than I ever let it get in my wood shop. And it's not because there's a fire like down the road. It's because there's a fire in like out in like Alberta, Canada or something. So massive that it's creating, you know, a couple days here and there isn't going to kill you. But like if that becomes the norm, that will kill you. And, and, and you know, even even for a lot of us who've been – very hawkish on climate, you start to think, fuck, you know, I thought this was something we're dealing with in 30 years and it's actually happening now. Totally. Well, and I think, you know, it just also to put in context of how 
you know, potentially historic this bill could be. It's, you know, they put in the outline that they're going to expand the child tax credit in reconciliation, which has not even really been one of like the marquee parts of it that people are really talking about. But the child tax credit is projected to have child poverty if they keep doing it every year. I mean, it's a huge, huge thing that would just drive at the heart of, I mean, it would over time come close to eradicating child poverty. I mean, that is, that's crazy. That's incredible. That's something that I don't think anyone would have expected to happen, you know, in a place where we, in a, in a chamber when we've got such, such small margins. But, you know, when I was on the Hill yesterday, I talked to Sherrod Brown and I was like, where are we at, where are we at with the extension? Because, you know, it, it's fairly clear that they are not going to be able to make it permanent in reconciliation because it's a relatively expensive policy. And thanks to the moderates kind of setting a cap on how much you can spend, you probably can't get that done. But he said, you know, he said unequivocally, there is agreement in the caucus to have a multi-year extension. And I mean, do we, and, that's and the, do we know what that is that, does that mean like three years, five years? I try, he wouldn't agree to a number. He wouldn't really pin it down for me, but but I guess on, on the same point, you as often, you know, there was a lot of demand rightly to kind of like, we just got to make this permanent. Mm -hmm. But I think where we are now is you figure if you get it in, if you get it going for two or three years, it's going to be really hard to, to pry that back. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, uh, going back to the, Ob I mean, we, I think we all know that that's basically what happened with Obamacare. Republicans were so dead set on getting rid of it, but once everybody's using it, it's really, really hard. And 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 um, one of the ba one of the many lessons, but not one that gets talked about enough from the Obama years. And it just it <laughs> it it just seems crazy in retrospect, and it was pretty crazy at the time that they passed Obamacare, but then they had basically about three years until it took effect. Right <laughs> now. There were, from a sort of a, you know, best practices policy standpoint, there were reasons for that. It's a big, it's a big thing to do. You can't just say, okay, tomorrow everybody has health insurance. <laughs> but what that did was create a situation where, you know, you pass it. Everybody's saying it's, Republicans saying it's terrible and death panels and blah, 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 blah. And, but you don't really see anything. You, you don't. No one was getting any there, – there was some stuff that was immediate, but not much. And so that helped create this protracted uh, period when it was very unpopular. And and clearly one of the things that the the Biden folks, who in most cases are, are the Obama folks, you know, 10 years older basically, um, have done is, man, like we're going to get this stuff out immediately, immediately, because we're not going to make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, not not as good as it should be, but pretty good. Right. Yeah. So, you know, no no hostility to the bipartisan bonami from us, but you know, the reconciliation package is really going to be the main event when it comes to you know, once in a generation yeah. legislating like we haven't seen. Yep. All right. So, let's answer some questions. Yes. The first we touched on, but we can we'll still answer it. This is from Chris. He says, "Why is McConnell supporting the mini infrastructure plan? What's his angle? Does he have some secret plan that could derail the larger bill or both bills somehow?" Well, clearly this question is from last week, so he cannot he can no longer derail the mini bill. He actually did vote for it, but I think the I think the question is one that people have been bringing up a lot. It just, it's, it seemed so unlikely that he didn't, you know, sink it from the first. What's kind of your take? Well, uh, at some level, I think he got outmaneuvered. I, I think it's, I think it's as simple as that. Um, I think now the other, I don't, I am pretty certain he does not have some secret plan to blow up the reconciliation bill. It's possible it could blow up on its own. I think that's very unlikely, but it's it's not the case that McConnell's got some secret plan. That's just that's just not the case. I do think that over this process of several months, that was one of their plans. That was 
a big part of one of their plans. That was kind of that was the plan. Kind of like let's let's give them a little more than we might want to on 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 the mini bill, and we're gonna as we were discussing earlier in the in the episode, then we'll blow up that. Um, and I think they just got outmaneuvered, and I think that there was um. You had, uh, you know, you have a half a dozen people in their caucus who kind of did actually did want this to happen. And it's it's never been totally clear to me who's who there. But I think you have five or six Republicans who really wanted this kind of bill to happen, not for sort of strategic reasons of blowing up the reconciliation bill. They may have wanted to do that too, but they actually substantively wanted this to happen. Now, that's not enough to make it happen. You need 10. Um, so I think some of it, again, is just he kind of got outmaneuvered. I think the other, the, only, the other way to look at it, which I think is an important way to look at it, is that now uh, when the bridge shows up in your district, you're not going to have people like me and Kate kind of dunking on you when you say, oh, con- you know, you're welcome for the bridge. <laughs> and Matter and, of time, though. Yeah, well, you're going to have it in. Um, uh, you'll probably have it in the house. But I mean, I, I look infrastructure, you know, roads, infrastructure, surface transportation infrastructure is is is, is always popular. Um, and I suspect there was an element of that kind of like, look, they're going to pass all this stuff. Um, we're going to run hard against all their, you know, social liberal spending stuff, but like some of that road stuff, I'd kind of like it to happen. And I don't want to be out there kind of like I didn't vote for the new road. (laughs) So I think there's some of that there. Um, but, but as we know with, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell, it's all zero sum. How do I hurt Joe Biden as much as I can? How do I how do I undermine his presidency as much as I can? I think they I think they got outmaneuvered. I think that is basically what happened. It has been kind of funny to watch after you know the weekend votes when it became clear that the bill was going to pass. Then you had some Republicans kind of reorient themselves against the bill to decide like it's particularly funny the ones who were part of the negotiating group who then you know on the last day were like never mind I cannot in good conscience vote for this and then they like point back to the CBO score which came out days ago and they're like well you know as if it's just hitting them now and then you know the inevitable follow-up question is Trump's opposition driving you? And they're like, oh, nothing to do with it. Just fiscally irresponsible. <laughs> and you're like, got well, it. You know, the other thing is, and w- one of the things very sh- kind of worth taking a moment to to focus on is that, as we know, they needed 10 Republicans. They got 18 Republicans. Yep. And uh, that shows a lot of things, but it kind of substantively shows that once you're not blocking it, it kind of disorients them, you know, kind of like, oh, it's going to, pa- well, oh, what, okay, I mean, I guess I'm for it or kind of, <laughs> it, it just shows that it's, 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 um, once that, uh, once that line is crossed, it kind of scrambles them. They all know when it's the, for the people, just know. Right. Even the people who kind of support some of it, no, just no, 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 and 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 not even just for the, everything, no, and no, and no. But again, once you once you're into normal votes, it's like they're thrown. Like, well, I mean, again, eighteen, that's overwhelming. It's like almost seventy votes. Well, and which I'm saying is the best argument for getting rid of the filibuster, even though I know that's not how the bipartisan bill will be used. But I feel like the bigger lesson we took from it is what you're saying as soon as you find out a bill is going to pass or has a chance to pass or isn't dead on arrival all of a sudden you kind of got people being like okay well you know maybe i can get some of my stuff in here maybe i can get in an amendment or two and then i'll vote for it and get to claim it i mean to me that's such a strong argument in favor of giving 
or even vice versa. There's a, I mean, from a, if you take a more, you know, I hate the word, but you know, kind of centrist perspective, if you're at, if you're on 50 votes on this bill, if it's, if it's, if it's close and you're a conservative Republican, maybe you say, well, God, there's one part I really don't like. And, and like, okay, I'll vote for it. I'll, I'll come over. If you get rid of that one thing, right. now that's not going to persuade like Sherrod Brown or Bernie Sanders, but it probably will. It, it probably will persuade like Joe Manchin or maybe like Mark Warner or these kind of people. And suddenly you're now again to me that's bad. You want the whole thing to pass, but if you're talking about actual getting the process of legislation, it as you say, it's it's a good reason to get rid of the filibuster, right? Okay, now our second question here is from Vince, uh, who says, you've reported that Senate Republicans have threatened to force Democrats to raise the debt ceiling on their own using budget reconciliation this fall. Um, He's asking, since you only have one budget reconciliation vehicle left for the year, does that mean Democrats might have to choose between using it to raise the debt ceiling or passing their infrastructure bill? And then his follow-up question is, if Democrats do have to raise the debt ceiling on their own using reconciliation, why can't they just add in an amendment to whatever they pass that abolishes the debt ceiling law entirely? I'm going to punt to you on the question of whether they need another vehicle. That has not been my understanding. Is that No, I think the, okay. the idea is that they could wrap the debt ceiling into their remaining vehicle, right. raising I mean, it into the vehicle. Right. So on... on I, Unfortunately, I mean, on on the last question, why don't they just abolish it? I well, I don't think they'd have the votes. Well, I agree they wouldn't have the votes, but would that pass the reconciliation rules? I don't know. It's so hard. That's a whole other question. Let's assume for the sake of conversation that it would pass the rec, you know, through Mm -hmm. the reconciliation rules. Unfortunately, you're just Kate's right. You're going to have a certain number say, "Oh, can't can't go there, can't do that." Because I mean, the whole thing, the, the whole thing is so stupid. And and frankly, I kind of this is that rare time that I think the Republicans have a bit of an argument here, and it's it's this that back in 2011 or 2013 or whenever that was when we was like defaulted on the on the on the on the uh, on on the um, you know federal debt. In that case, Democrats could not do it. It only Republicans could do it. They controlled it, so it really was hostage taking. You're taking the, the the full faith and credit hostage. In this case, Democrats can do it. They they don't like that Republicans are forcing them to do it on their own, and and it is slimy that they're doing that. But it's not the same thing because they can do it. They just don't want to do it on their own because then people will say, oh, you, you know, you were responsible for 20 kajillion dollars and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we were just talking yeah, about remind me the question. why why can't you abolish it altogether, which we kind of addressed. And um, it's all the same reasons, because. These politicians do not want to be hit on the campaign trail or for the leaders, you know, for their members to be hit with, oh, you signed off on allowing five trillion dollars of more debt or you signed off on endless debt. So then Republicans can say you signed off on. Five hundred trillion because it's endless, you know, just just all of this kind of that's why. Yeah, I mean, to go to your your point on the Republican argument, though, it is like so ridiculous as to almost be laughable. Like the way they keep framing it is if Democrats don't raise the debt ceiling via reconciliation, they're being so irresponsible, you know, flirting with a global economic disaster. And you're like, okay, parse that for a sec. It's like Democrats are being irresponsible because if they don't do it in reconciliation, they're giving Republicans the opportunity to be irresponsible and to not raise the debt ceiling and to unleash economic catastrophe. So Democrats are only being irresponsible if they insist that Republicans are being part of the process, who's the only party planning to be irresponsible on this vote. Which, if 
if you're of the mindset that Democrats are responsible for basically babysitting Republicans and making sure that their destructive tendencies don't get to play out, that's a position. Fine. But the twisting that it's Democrats who are being irresponsible is so ridiculous. Democrats aren't the ones who are threatening not to raise the debt ceiling. Yeah, I mean, this is something that is deeply embedded in 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 D.C. journalistic DNA. And that is kind of what you said, that it actually is the assumption of the political class that it is Democrats' responsibility to prevent Republicans from destroying more things. That, that, that is literally the assumption. It is not always stated as such, but if you look at everything, that is all, I mean, it, you know, you see it across the board, always. Um, oh, this happened, that happened, this, this other happened. And it is, again, because for a variety of reasons, the commentating class, the political class, journalists work on the assumption that Republicans will act in highly destructive ways. And that is just kind of a baked in assumption. And if it's a baked in assumption, then what are you going to do about it, Democrats? Who's going to Who's going to prevent all these terrible things? Oh my God, I'm, you just, know, I'm like preemptively gritting my teeth about all the headlines we're going to see about Democrats being irresponsible when it's not Democrats. It's Republicans who are being irresponsible. Yeah, it's just baked in. It's baked and, in that, 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 uh, that Republicans do those things. And to some degree, I don't know, I've almost admired the Democratic response being like, no, we're not doing it during reconciliation. Like, we're not going to mess up our like huge, big landmark piece of legislation because Republicans are threatening not to raise the ceiling. And I mean, it's dangerous for sure, because if Republicans make good on that threat, that would be cataclysmic. Well, here's 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 the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. It is still different in one key way. The Democrats control the chamber. They control both chambers. And if it really push comes to shove, they can resolve the problem with with 50 votes. So really, it's a Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema thing. And that was not the case back in, again, I lose track of what year it was, but the, uh, I guess it would have... Wait a second. Um, 2011 was when... The credit rating was downgraded and all that. Right. So that was, uh, well, it was because I guess the Democrats still had the Senate. Right. Republicans had just the, won the House in but 2010. they didn't have the House. Um, so it is still kind of different. So it, I could see the Democrats maybe doing it because, again, they do have that. At least Joe Manchin has that fail safe. I mean, so They're far not, they said that they won't. So we'll see. It wasn't in the budget reconciliation outline. Right, right. Well, I guess, it, and again, so it's not, um, you know, is it how important is the is the full faith and credit to Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema? I mean, I, you know, for for you were, I don't want to think how old you were back when that happened, but for those of us who were <laughs> reporting on it at the time, you know, they even had this like platinum coin idea. Do you know about this? Yep, yep. You know, <laughs> it was it was it really got insane. All the totally bananas things they were thinking about of how you would you know, how you would get out of this situation. Purely um, because House Republicans wanted to extract a political victory. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. And I cuts just, and, yeah. All, all, I'm just yeah. saying, I just think the onus should be with the people who are threatening to blow up the economy. And that's currently only one party is doing that. So, yeah. well, that's, and that's, I mean, that's and the now, world we live in. So far, at least, Democrats are kind of calling the bluff, I think, based on how this has gone in the past which is right. you know after 2011 when obama was like yeah i'm not negotiating with terrorists anymore basically they made a stink about it but they always backed off because yeah republicans backed off because i mean the alternative is kind of unthinkable so i guess if they do omit it from the reconciliation package which is what they've kind of given all the signs they're going to do mm -hmm. it just comes down to are there 10 republicans who are responsible enough to not let a global economic catastrophe tear through right at the same right. time that a pandemic is tearing through so right 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 okay Fun. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I guess that's all we got for today. Um, mm-hmm. Hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, specially prepared content, the podcast <laughs> content for your for your listening pleasure. Uh, remember that the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. If you're ready to give it a try, you can get 25% off your first order at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. That's Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. All right. All right. Later. Thanks, everyone.